have a fantastic show for you now. Let's head over to Zoom where we can greet Aline and learn all about everything you wanted to know about art. I totally messed that up, didn't I? It's everything you always wanted to know about art. But we're afraid to ask. <laughs> but we're afraid to ask, of course. I have to say, um, I really thought that Chef Dan was standing there with you. Oh, really? Um, this is the beginning of a series of paintings that I want to do because I'm involved so much in this place on a daily basis. And what I've been going around doing is looking at people doing what they do and coming up with ideas for paintings. And I would like to do about 12 to 15 of these canvases and turn it into maybe a coffee table book or something that MPTF could use to their advantage. That's uh, incredible. I, I know a couple of people you could talk to about that. Well, <laughs> that's that's great. Uh, maybe, but but I know Jennifer and myself pretty good, and we should wait till I have at least six canvases done. You got it. No problem. I am eighty-two. <laughs> um, Any, go ahead. Who, I, I just who gonna, is it? Who is it? <laughs> I'm going to sit back. I am thrilled because my understanding is you're going to start us at the very beginning of everything in today's conversation. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, may I ask, uh, who is this young lady at the bottom of the screen that I've never met? Aline Ramrus, you don't even know me. It's your friend, MJ. <gasps> oh, MJ. Oh, Jennifer. MJ is a She's my hero. <laughs> She's genius. <laughs> we're, besides that, we're really good friends, and we're probably going to be in, in trouble a lot. <laughs> yeah, we've been we've been running up phone bills, but yeah. uh, yeah. but uh, I will. I'm, I just wanted to say hello, and I will step aside. You are in for a treat. She's 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 a pistol. That Aline Ramrus. Yes, sir. Well, oh, thank you. Well, no, 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 no. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to um, become an audience member. Really looking forward to it. Okay, good enough. Bye. Bye. Have fun. Okay. Um, Eileen. Yes, sir. Hi. <laughs> Hello, dear, dear boss, sir. <laughs> Producer, sir. <laughs> um, and today, I'm going to talk about the beginning of the very... The script to this program today reads like war and peace, but there was nothing I could do about that. And also, uh, I want you to call in if you have questions or if you have comments. And uh, and if I don't know the answers, I'll find them uh, because that's what makes it interesting it, it, are, are questions. Who's the, who, who's the guy behind you, not the one with the chef hat? Oh, no. Oh, well, that's there for a reason because I'm going to talk about that later. Why? Did you did you think you knew him? <laughs> well, no. Uh, 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 he's missing his head. Oh, yes, his head's on the other side, actually, of the... But he, uh, he, he, he's possessive of other other body parts. <laughs> Well, what can I do? You know, he's a boy. <laughs> uh, so here we go. Uh, Bob Marish and I are here to excite all of you with another installment of everything you've always wanted to know about art. As you can see, I'm about halfway into this canvas of our kitchen genius, Chef Dan. Hopefully, the next time that we have this program, I'll be closer to finishing. However, today, we're going to talk about our history. Art gives us pictures of who we are and who we were. Art historians have divided art into timelines. They are called art movements. 
Today, we are going to attempt to make sense of some of this. There are about 25 art movements that stretch over about 3,000 years. That's a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. We are discussing and defining art movements that began at the very beginning. Art can be traced back to our prehistoric grandparents, even before some of us were born. The old Stone Age, even before written language, we were busy drawing, sculpting, and painting. And art movement, by the way, simply means something like philosophy or goal. Its emphasis is based in the culture of the time that it happened. It's a direct reflection of who we were and what we were thinking and doing. It's our authentic history. When you look at ancient art, you're looking at something or from ancient through up till now. You're looking at something that is authentic. And as they say, one picture is worth a thousand words. So you're not looking at a history that somebody wrote and rewrote and polished or whatever you're looking at what really was. And that's why it's, it's extraordinarily important. Okay, can I have my first slide, Mary Jane? I'll have a lot of slides, everybody, as we go along to help identify and uh, describe what I'm talking about. The first art movement was just called ancient. It began being labeled about 500 BC. As far as we know now, our first art came from engravings, small carvings found in a cave in India. The uh, and interestingly enough, the, the cave was called the auditorium. I thought that was interesting. But these little indentations and channels in the rock were made in a large rock and could not be used for anything practical. They were- Do we have, do we have pictures of these? Those you do, I do not have pictures of. Uh -huh. uh, and they were decorative. They were just a decorative item. Someone created these little cups, hollowed out these little cups and stripes in a huge rock because they just wanted to sit and look at it. And that is what we called our first art. Expert believe, experts believe that these uh, carvings in that rock, by the way, are about 36,000 years old. Caves were our first art galleries. We all know this. I mean, you can imagine uh, the caves that you've been through, the caves that you see. Uh, the uh, Can I have the hunting slide next. There we go. Caves were our first art galleries. Exhibits of hunting scenes. Uh, hunting was very big then, you know. There are a lot of these kinds of, of cave drawings. These cave drawings were made mostly of ochre or charcoal, and they were there were no brushes, of course. So these things were painted with our fingers or little sticks. Aileen? Yes, sir. Were the, 
like the the animal in the middle of that. It, the color of that, is that ochre? Yes, that is ochre, yes. Uh, to begin with, we only had ochre and charcoal. And we'll, we'll, but it looks like there's a yellow background to it. Well, that, that background is just whatever the cave wall was. We didn't, we only had those kinds of to paint on at that time. We didn't have uh, canvases or wood panels or that, that didn't happen for a while. Paint, as you're using the term, meant mm -hmm. charcoal and okra. Uh, okra, O-C-H-R-E. Um, okay. Yes, as a matter of fact, I'm going to uh, give you a little demonstration of okra because it's very interesting. Uh, in a couple of pages, I'll give you that. Uh, we now need to see the hands slide. Next. There we go. Also, abstracts and sculptures drew big crowds. Hand stencils were being shown in charcoals and ochre, and that's exactly what you're seeing on the screen. And I use ochre as a basic on my palette today, as do most artists. Ochre is a brownish yellow color. It is produced in clay pigments that contain ferric oxide, it's, which is also known as rust. I mean, so it's just rust. And it, we mix these, we mix rust, they did, they mix rust and sand and anything they could find the saliva a lot. They use their own saliva a lot. And uh, other animal fat, all different kinds of things as binders for, the, it's amazing that these things survive as long as they have. These pigments are also the first pigments that were used by humans. As with most natural pigments, there are many shades of ochre, which you can see in this slide. This one is half a dozen base colors used on our modern palettes. And I'm gonna show you ochre as, this is the ochre that I use. This is about today. This is uh, made much the same way with the addition of a, a modern binder in the paint. This is used much the same way. It's much the ingredients that we used in caveman times. It's still the same stuff. With saliva? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, you're such a producer. <laughs> no, you, uh, this is, um, as I just said, we have a common, a modern binder in it now. So what we usually use is linseed oil and, uh, or something, whatever else, your walnut oil, linseed oil, uh, anything, but we do not use plastics in oil paints uh, because they are still organic. One of the, I'm gonna show you the color that over is. Okay, here's, here's ochre. You can see how natural that shade is. And if you look at the painting behind, you can see the ochre popping through in all kinds of places in this painting. And it's the same with most paintings that you will see. Ochre is a common uh, color on a basic palette. And there are basic palettes, which we should have a program of, on which are interesting. The, the, now, can, okay, now, can we have the uh, slide again? Okay. The first cave artists put the paint in their mouths and blew around their hand. In other words, they would put the hand 
their hand up on the cave wall and around it to make what you're seeing in this slide. Well, <clears throat> this turned our teeth green, so we invented brushes later. Um, the facing of the cave walls caused conflict in the cave home. As caves were communal at that time, can you just hear it now? Thor and Thorine complaining to the neighborhood association. <laughs> the guy who lives next to us makes awful marks on his section of the cave wall. Then he digs around in all of the campfires and puts charcoal in his mouth. He calls himself an artist. Well, we would just call him weird. And I'm sure that that would apply today. I mean, if, if somebody saw me out at the front gate blowing around my hand, be, I, we'd be in trouble. So, now, uh, so he, he would have green teeth too, right? Well, I would, yeah. And, you know, I, it's not good. It's not a really good look. There are a lot of cavemen with green teeth. Oh, wow. Um, I, 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 I met a few, actually. <laughs> I'm from Texas, you know. Oh, that, that explains it. <laughs> yes. Um, the next slide is of the Olafels Venus. Can, there we go. Ah, uh, take a look at this girl. <laughs> the next famous item we have for you today is a small sculpture, obviously crafted by a man. <laughs> As you can see, it's what every man dreams of. A woman with a tiny head and very large breasts. <laughs> it's called the Venus of Olafal Belt. And she's about 35,000 years old. And little has changed. Just compare Ola with her sister. Can I have my Butero slide up there? There we go. There's the Butero slide. Just compare Ola with her sister, the contemporary Butero that you're seeing on the screen now. I think that that sort of lets us know what's going on. Now, if I can have the ancient slide again. The Greek, Roman, and Germanic sculptures and art are included in this time period. These poor statues have been copied so many, many times. You see them absolutely everywhere. The ones decorating the end of the driveway next door are plain with no color probably. However, that's not how these works of art were originally. So what you're looking at on the screen probably was not like that in the beginning. They were painted all over, even down to the eyeliner and lipstick. As we speak, an expert team of archeologists are studying the tiny speck of paint they found in the crevices of these paintings in order to restore these works of ancient art. Our next art movement is medieval. And every time I say that medieval, I think of that line out of Pulp Fiction, the, the movie where they say, He's gonna, I'm gonna get medieval on you, man. <laughs> so it's, a, it's an interesting word. It goes from about 500 BC to about 1550. These are the beginnings 
of religious power. You remember Constantine was around this time. He came around 300 BC, if, I, if I'm correct in that. And, uh, and that, and he began to sow the seeds of Christianity and things began to change. And the beginnings of religious power took root at this time and profoundly affected what art would become for the next thousand years. And, and still today, uh, it affects uh, art in certain ways. Thank goodness not the way it did then. But these were mystical times. Florence, Italy was the most important place for classical art. It was home to the Medici family, and the Medici family uh, is responsible for sowing the seeds of the Renaissance, which we'll talk about next in our next program, because it was, I was going to try to talk to you about it today, but it's just too much to cover. And it's too important to not spend a lot of time but the Medici family were originally bankers and lenders, financiers, and there were even they even had four popes in their family. So they were very closely intertwined and mixed up in art and philosophy and money and real estate uh, building creativity, all of the above. And they were very wealthy, so they had access to uh, written books and on and on and on. They were a very powerful family. They started the uh, art school in Florence, actually, in the Uffizi. My, the master that I painted with for 10 years studied at the Uffizi, studied at the uh, at Florence Academy, which goes back to being started by the Medici family. That's a long time ago, and they still uh, adhere to these classical ways of painting. So, and that's really how I was taught to paint. It's very difficult today to find uh, a master in classical art, but it's worth it if you look. Um, so these were mystical times. Florence, Italy was the most important place for classical art as we define it today. Greatly because of an artist by the name of Giotto. We had little Giotto in his orange outfit. There's Giotto. Uh, you can see jo uh, Giotto was a, you know, uh, a dramatic dresser, a real artist. Giotto and what and how he painted. Giotto lived from 1267 to 1338 and is called the father of the Renaissance. Giotto painted in a new way. He indicated, though he didn't yet understand it or paint it, he knew he was on to something different. And it was beginning to bud, and that was perspective, shadow, realism, as we know it today in painting, which we'll see a lot of when we talk about the Renaissance. There were other things in the mix as well. Christianity was an idea that solved many human dilemma, dilemmas. Monks on their little donkeys traveled from village to village with their triptych altarpieces. And I think we have some, there we go. There's one. Now, what's, if you look at these little triptych uh, art pieces. I think I have three of them to show you. They're very interesting 
And if you ever have the chance to see any in a museum, and you will, because they they always have them. Uh, they the method of painting was that they would paint. So, for instance, they would paint like uh, the the Mary or the or the Jesus or whoever they were painting the central figure. They would paint that figure large. He would be the that that figure would be the largest figure on the canvas, but the other figures would all be smaller, like they were little dolls or miniatures. They were not, but that was the way of depicting the lesser important and glorious thing if you look at these things. There was a lot of gold leaf going on, which was, as you can imagine, if you were uh, a peasant or, or a, a provincial, and the, this monk came by and, and uh, he had this wonderful little piece of art, which he pulled up, opened up to reveal these wonderful figures backed by gold. I mean, very impressive stuff. These altarpieces showed scenes of a virgin woman who gave birth. Angels with wings. God. Church officials. And patrons showing their devotion to a higher power. These altarpieces could easily be propped up anywhere. They were our first movies. Can I have my next slide, please? Aha. Altar pieces turned into art masterpieces. Think the Sistine Chapel. That is where these little Giotto mass, uh, uh, triptychs, and there were other, you know, Giotto was a part of a studio. There were a lot of uh, painters in these studios, as everybody knows. We'll talk about that, too. Um, they were our first movies, and they grew from into masterpieces. And these masterpieces grew, in, grew into glorious stained glass windows. And later, can I have my next slide? Cecil B. DeMille movies. Monks were busy copying the Bible. Nuns worked as illustrators decorating the pages. These are some of the most glorious books ever produced. Art was a powerful, dramatic, and economical means of spreading the word. Art was a tool of the church at this time. Artists found jobs, though. Some of us were really good artists and even lived with the priests and wealthy patrons. During this time, we began to section off and create rooms into our living spaces. These rooms created large blank walls, and we needed stuff to hang on these walls. Art. So that's as far as we're going to take it today. Please call in now and ask questions if you have any. Uh, and let us know how you feel about this or ask questions. Hi. Hi Jen. So um, I had to put my glasses on so I could see the monitor from the distance because it's amazing, amazing pieces of art. Um, you said that your instructor studied in Florence. Did he study at the Uffizi? Yes. He studied at the Academ Academy of Art at the Uffizi. She, and it's a she. she. Sorry, she. 
Yeah, and, forgive me. And, and not a he. And I studied for 10 years with her. That's awesome. Um, it takes a while. <laughs> so have you been over to Florence? I wish, no. I, no, I've been a lot of places but I have never been to Florence. It's, that's, if you know anyone who'd like to raise money. <laughs> well, follow me. Yeah, we, yeah sure. <laughs> what I mean, you'd have me carrying your bags. <laughs> no, I mean the, I mean the, the oh. money raiser thing. Oh, on, oh. On, no. I, oh, I get it. Okay. Um, okay, so, I love that you, at the beginning of this, were like, here's, um, tell me the name of that color again. Okra. Okra. All right. And I, I started to. Okra. No, no, not okra. Eating it. Oh, it's ochre. O-C-H-R-E. Ochre. ochre. Yeah, and that, yes. Um, which I believe I sang multiple times in the you know, myriad of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat productions that I have been in in my lifetime, that ochre is one of those that just is in the list of the multicolored coat. Oh, uh-huh. But when you just, you just took your paintbrush and just, you know, put it on. When you first put oil, oil paints to a canvas, were you hesitant? Were you enthusiastic? Like, do you remember that first time that you smelled the grease paint and applied it? Actually, it came in stages. Uh, I began drawing uh, when I was four years old because I was very attracted to my grandmother's rug. I would lay on her rug and copy the patterns that were on her Oriental rugs. I was in love. She had a wonderful bunch of these patterned oriental rugs in her house. And I, I started copying those. I was four years old at the time. Wow. But my um, my mother and my grandmother uh, nurtured me along because they saw that I was weird and different. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> Hi, this is Richard. I have a question for Aline. Hello, Richard. It's so good to hear from you. Um, Aline, Richard's on the line. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yes, oh, yes. So, Aline. Yes. You talked about um, the cave painting and how the uh, colors were made from okra, from charcoal, and mm -hmm. pigments that they could find. But before uh, oil painting evolved, I mean, obviously water and... Uh, as you said, different types of oils were used. But mm -hmm. and the very earliest paintings were done with egg tempera. Could you explain what egg tempera was? Oh, yes, you're right, Richard. Um, egg tempera is uh, actually egg tempera was some of the first ways that pigments were used uh, before oil paint. Uh, they were used in frescoes. Now, frescoes... Um, can, Richard, can you explain uh, how you paint how you, how you paint on frescoes? I only know that uh, you paint on... You mix up this egg tempera recipe. Right. And, well, egg and then you paint on wet plaster that yeah, then the wet paint plaster. So, that. Yeah. So um, egg temper was used. Again, Again. the thing that is uh, important about the evolution of painting was, you know, like all art, the improvement in technology, egg temper was one of the very first ways of suspending pigments in a solution and it basically used egg white yes uh, um, you turn your turn your television with, down because i'm getting feedback and i want to hear every word okay yes 
Thank you. Thank you. Now, now tell me, egg temper was the egg white well, used to go on. Egg white mixed with pigment. Right. And it was usually used uh, painting on, as you said, early painting was done on fresco, which is like terracotta. Right. Uh, they were painting directly on architecture on walls. Right. So right. egg tempera was used for a long time, but the evolution of oil paint was a huge, huge breakthrough because the problem with early uh, forms of paint, which egg tempera was, is that they dried really quickly. And therefore, you could not mix the color. You couldn't continue to move it around on the canvas or on the wall. So that was the big breakthrough with oil, was that when you paint, as, as you well know, um, Aline, as you can explain how important it is that the surface remains uh, alive for a while so you can mix these colors around. And it, it, if paint dries too quickly, you really can't do much with it. That, you know, that's a, uh, an interesting facet that you're talking about, Richard, because uh, when you said, you, you used the word alive just now, and that's extraordinarily important with painting with oil, is that it does remain alive because you paint, it, oil painting is a matter of problem solving. That's all it is. It's just problem solving and chasing the light. Uh, we're, all we're artists are interested in, really, is getting the light right where it, where it will tell a story to you. And see this on your monitor. Uh, the light in this goes right, you see it going right around here. And the light is, is, is defined by the light source, but not that alone. It's defined by the how the fabric is molded and wrinkled and ruffled or whatever. So the fabric being rolling along is and the light are defining what the painting will become. And those are, that's just two things. It's also underneath, you have to demonstrate that this man's body is going in a certain, he has a certain body language. If that body language is not correct, then the shirt over him won't be correct. The light source won't be correct. So it all has to fit. So because of all of that that's involved in it, the, as Richard said, the light, the, the medium, the paint, has to remain alive for quite a while to allow you to work into those things. Because as you're painting this, as you go along, the painting, the, whatever you're painting, reveals itself to you. The painting actually will reveal what it is and what it wants you to do. Well, there's another aspect to uh, the quality of paint, and especially oil, is that when one is painting with paint, it is additive. When you add more colors together, they become darker. So when you paint, basically, when Aline starts the painting, she lays down an, the underpainting, which is usually a darker color, like okra. Yeah. And then you start working from the darkest colors to the lighter. So the very last thing in many paintings are the highlights in a person's eyes. Yes. You work from the light, 
Now, if you were working in another media, say watercolor, you have to you work you you're you're working with dark only. You have to leave the white of the canvas or the white of the paper because you cannot paint back lighter colors. Very difficult stuff. So again, when you're working on a painting, you're working from dark to light, and you can put the lighter colors on top. So when Aline is doing that that chef's coat, uh, she did not start by making the whole thing white. Correct. No. No, the whole the, the whole thing was uh, burnt umber, which is a, again another organic, readily available color that artists have used since time immemorial. It's it's all very old organic stuff. So with oil painting, you were able to paint lighter over darker. Yes. With, uh, yes. Other early paints, they did not have light pigments. So they could not paint from dark to light. They basically just painted, like the cave paintings, they're just all uh, a single darker yeah, color. Whatever came through, came through. They were, those were abstracts, Richard. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what we, we call them, is abstracts. So uh, another thing that's interesting that I, I maybe that I didn't uh, tell you about is the uh, drawing on in the back. This is a charcoal that I did in a class about a dozen years ago, and uh, this is just rhyme charcoal. I mean, this is the same thing you can pick up out of a campfire and draw with. Uh, it, and uh, it's wonderful stuff. The reason charcoal is so wonderful to use to draw with uh, is because you can it easily you can easily remove it from the work surface if you need to, and also it allows you to work with shapes, not lines. Lines are a killer in art because there really are no lines. And many times uh, you'll see, you know, people will take art classes and they're very unhappy with their work because it comes out looking flat or, you know, the, the well, face doesn't... Well, as you doesn't... can see from, from uh, her charcoal life drawing there, when you're drawing with charcoal, as when you're drawing with a pencil or so, you are really only laying down the dark values. So she had to do that drawing, leaving the lighter colors as, as the raw paper. So this you're really- This uh, This fellow, the, the model that you see the torso of, this is his face. So he did not paint white on the face. No, there, there's nothing on here just except buying charcoal and uh, an eraser, you know, uh, to pull uh, charcoal off of the surface where it was needed. And it's the most wonderful, simple, direct way of illustrating to my way of thinking. So, Richard? Yes? Um, I have a question, the same question that I asked um, Aline, I ask you. The first time that you actually took um, paint and applied it and started to feel that sense of how the canvas has to be alive and how the paint has to be able to, uh, the different paints need to be able to work with each other and, um, in that moment, did you know I'm hooked for life? This is something I that's that's it's inside me, and I have to put out on on canvas. Well, I was uh, very lucky. My mother was a wonderful artist, and from the time I was very young, 
I used to watch her paint and draw, and then I just started imitating that. And initially it was drawing, it was not painting. And so it was like a, a progressive learning of the textures of the medium. It wasn't like you're defining like an instant where I first put paint to canvas and went, oh my God, this is... Yeah, no, that doesn't happen. Learning experience, but what I loved, and uh, Aline and all of us who were in the arts, is we love the image. We love beauty, and we love uh, to be able to take something from your imagination or to look at a still life and to be able to recreate that on a two-dimensional plane with whatever medium, whether it's charcoal or when you're a little kid, it's crayons or whatever. But Crayolas, Richard. Those, uh, yeah, I called the, those were called Crayolas. <laughs> Crayola. <laughs> we learned, you know, when you start to learn about shading and shadows and those kind of things, that's yeah. when you really start to get uh, hooked into image creating. Because once you start to make something on a canvas that's dimensional, it's not just a silly little line drawing of a car or a or a you know a face that people draw on their notebooks that kind of but once you start to really create shaded images and they have dimensionality that's where the magic of painting starts to become uh addictive it, it's it's what happens is when you look at something you don't see it intellectually you see it emotionally is that the right way to explain it richard yes in a way i i think you know people who are drawn to art i mean i was very lucky i i had the intuition i loved drawing and um and I loved painting and so forth because I had examples of it by my mother working. And, um, you know, other people who are grow up in artistic families who basically get to experience the arts, it's entirely different than someone who basically has no artistic uh, background in their family and you only see something when you go to a gallery or in a book. But when you watch somebody actually draw something and create it, it really seems magic. You know, I mean, when you're kids and you go to Disneyland and you sit down and you pay five bucks and they do a portrait of you, if you watch that portrait being drawn, you are just amazed at how, where does that knowledge come from? How to know what the proportions are how to get the eyes the right distance apart and the shape of the head and all of the things to be you and not just some generic, you know, human head. Um, so that's what artists do. They, they love detail. They love the subtlety of the way things look. And whether it's from your imagination, I mean, artists are people that have imaginations, and I will be have a million images in my head and I am willing to take the time it takes to finally get one of those images out on a on a surface so that I can see it and that other people might enjoy it. So oh, you know image. what might be interesting to offer up at this point is the, the canvas that I'm working on uh, behind me uh, Richard and I consulted on this because there were four or five different images in my head about what this should be. And it was very, very tough. Uh, and Richard and I had several discussions and Richard came to my studio and helped me out a great deal by helping me uh, clarify my own thinking and uh, edit these images that I had in my brain because I had so many that I was confused. And a lot of times that happens and 
uh, sometimes I think that we're, I think we're just born this way, frankly. And uh, um, I don't know what, do you agree with that, Richard? Canvas. Well, that question that she asked about the first painting, when you really uh, fall in love with art, you fall in love with the process. And yes, yes. Artist, you have to get in a dance with the process. You put energy into painting every day, and you it will teach you. You because we in most things in this world we learn from mistakes. And you're painting, and all of a sudden the paint doesn't go the way that you want. It kind of runs, and you say, "Oh no, that isn't what I wanted." But a year later, you may be working on a painting, and you want it to look like water running down a window, or tears, or something. And that mistake that you made a year ago, where the paint ran in a way, it's a part of your vocabulary now, and you do it intentionally, and it ends up being the perfect solution for the problem. And somebody in the gallery sees the painting and oh my god how do you know to do that to make that look like rain running down that window right and you learned from being in the dance with the process and it teaching you so you have to work at painting every day which work in painting is not work no it's a human endeavor uh, it's a human function, uh, and some people have asked me, well, what's it like? And in a way, it, it, it's like eating or any other kind of function that that you, ha you have as a human being. Uh, it, it's as organic to, I think, for I think it's an organic function of an artist. And I noticed that it's 2.57, and um, I think Mr. Mary, she's going to want to close this program off. Yeah, let, it, me, uh, let me get him what, equal screen time here for you. Hold on one second. Mr. Mirish. Yes, ma'am. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you, A, for producing this show, for saying to Aline, Come on, come on, you gotta talk about your art. Thank you, Richard, for joining in this conversation. Oh, I think, it was an invaluable, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. And I'm excited to learn more about the history of art, the evolution, how things changed. I have questions from my own love of art um, in terms of pointillism and impressionism, one of my favorite periods, but also, about something as simple as symmetry. symmetry. Because yes. that is, go ahead, Elaine, sorry. Go ahead, Elaine, sorry. <laughs> and extraordinarily important. Well, when she gets into the Renaissance, she'll start to talk about perspective and symmetry and, and the composition of, of, of paintings, because that is such an important part, is the design overall design of the layout of things. It's not just a simple object. You're talking about the composition of the whole frame. Yeah. And uh, there's also, when you talk about perspective, I know there's perspective in terms of um, layout and organization of a painting that you're going to do. But I would uh, also love for you guys to talk about, and I'm not going to remember the name of the painting right now, but at the National Gallery in England, at Trafalgar Square, there is a, a well-known painting where if you stand in the center of the room, it, oh, it looks, yes. right? You know what I'm talking about? I do. And then if, you, do. if you go to the very, very edge of the painting, you see the skull. You see the skull on the floor. Yes, yes. Yeah. I don't know the name of the painting or the artist, but I know the painting. Richard, thank you so much for calling and join us again. 
Oh, yes. He's thank wonderful. You. It's and he, be he's a part smart, of all Jen. Uh, thank you, Bob. And thank you, Aileen. Thank you, Aileen. Thank you.